Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Sunday service of worship on today, the 28th of March 2021. It's Palm Sunday today. We will hopefully be out of this period of lockdown soon. And you may have heard that some churches are planning to open their doors for worship on Easter Sunday. Now, as you may have gathered from our announcements a few weeks ago, both sessions have met and we have discussed the reopening of churches. And it was unanimous that your safety and well-being is the most precious thing to us. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that. Therefore, we feel it is prudent to wait a couple of weeks before opening our doors in order to keep you that little bit safer, especially since the restrictions for the rest of the country haven't yet been relaxed. It would also mean that many of our over 70s will have had their second vaccination when we reopen. Also, since I'm planning to take a couple of weeks of annual leave after Easter, it would be easier to remain online until I return after my break. Now, I understand that some people are relieved at this announcement. Maybe you're a bit apprehensive about gathering when the rest of the country isn't allowed to. I also understand that some people are further frustrated by this because they've been looking forward to getting back to church, especially with Easter being such an important time of year for us. But that's also one of the reasons why we've decided to leave it a few weeks, because Easter Sunday is a very important time in our church calendar, and so many people might feel the pressure to attend in person, which would perhaps draw a bigger crowd. Although it would be nice if people felt the need to come to church and worship every Sunday instead of just Easter Sunday. But we can still celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ wherever we are, at any time of the year. And as a wise woman said the other day, Jesus Christ is risen no matter where we worship. He is still alive. And so as you reflect on this announcement, please do keep at the forefront of your mind that this was made with your safety and protection in mind. We want to be open and we will be opening in a few weeks, but we want to be wise and sensitive in the process. I'd like to remind you of our afternoon tea box at Mossside and Toberdoni are offering for anyone who would like one. You can request one for yourself or you can request one for your loved one. However, tomorrow is the deadline for ordering one of these. But if you know someone who would like an afternoon tea box, then here's the details that you need. For Moss Side members, please contact Linda Rowe on 077-4908-3614 or Lynn Barr on 077-450-92089. If you do plan to phone, please phone after 3 p.m. Or alternatively, you can send a text at any time. For Toberdoni, please contact Barbara Hill on 0788 or Lorna Morrison on 077-467-64086. Each church will provide the catering for their own congregation in the respective halls. Please do call your respective person giving the name of who you would like to receive the afternoon tea box if it's not for yourself and also inform of any allergies. Orders have to be placed by tomorrow at the latest. That's Monday, tomorrow, the 29th of March for catering purposes. On Saturday, the 3rd of April, this Saturday coming, afternoon tea boxes will be available for collection between half 12 and two o'clock in the respective halls. Anyone who can't make it to the halls, please contact the ladies and delivery will be discussed. Again, I would like to thank all of those who will be taking part in arranging this, in baking whatever goods are being baked for every part of it. Thank you for your service in this way. Our call to worship today is taken from our passage today. It's Psalm 22, verses 22 to 23. It says this, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honour him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. Let's declare our praise to him now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you. All of us gathered around a screen of various sizes, we are assembled before you in your presence because your presence is everywhere. 
And so as we assemble together, but apart, we declare your praise. We worship you. We adore you. We fall on our knees and we revere your name. You have the power over life and death. You have the say in what happens to us. You are the life giver. You are the provider. You are the almighty, powerful God of the universe. God who cares. God who loves. God who offers grace and mercy to anyone who humbles themselves. We thank you for that grace and mercy which is through, shown to us through Jesus Christ. We thank you that he suffered and died so that we could live. And what a death he suffered. He suffered so that we could have hope. Hope of a better day. Hope of a better future. Hope of a time when sickness and COVID-19 will be a thing of the past. But this is not just a hope. We believe it is an assurance because your word tells us so. And your word is infallible. So as we worship you, we bring all those things in our lives that trouble us. All those fears and anxieties. All those things that bring us down and get us down. All those worries and stresses. We bring them before you and we lay them at your feet. And we ask you to remove these things from us. And replace them with your love and your comfort. We think of our doctors and nurses, pharmacists, care home workers, all health care workers at the minute. We thank you for their sacrifice and we pray for strength as they continue to face this pandemic. We thank you for our teachers. We pray that you will give them energy and stamina as they now teach face to face. But it's come at a time when online pressures have been huge. Teachers need a break. And so may they get a rest over Easter. May they know how much we support them and appreciate them. For our farmers who keep going throughout this, providing for our daily needs regardless. For those who work in shops, for those who work in all areas of industry, we thank you and pray for each one of them as they continue to risk themselves as they work. And for those who are unable to work due to restriction, illness, whatever the reason, we pray that you will continue to provide for them and they will know that you have not forsaken them, for you do not forsake anyone. And for this we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Bible reading today is taken from two places. First of all, Matthew 27 and then Psalm 22. This is the word of the Lord, which says, They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And then over to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted you and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. 
But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And amen. That is the word of the Lord, and we thank him for it. Boys and girls, do you know where I am? I'm at the park. Yes. Do you know why? Look at me. I'm all dressed up. Got my nice shirt on, my jacket on. I've even got my hat on. That's right. Do you know why? I am going on a date uh -huh. with my wife. Just to clarify, going on a date with my wife. Kate phoned me and said she's going to... Uh, wants to take me out on a date? Mm hmm. Isn't that amazing? I haven't been out on a date in so long. And she said, Meet me in the park for uh, for the date. Oh, I'm so excited. I haven't been on a date in so long. Uh, she told me to meet her at three o'clock. And it's now. It's now 20 past three. So. She's a wee bit late. But that's, that, that's Kate. She says three o'clock, she might come at seven o'clock. I mean, that's, that's just Kate, that's okay. Oh, my phone, hold on. Phone out. Excuse me. Hello? Hmm? What? Oh, why not? What? Oh, Kate. Oh. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Whatever, bye. <sighs> Boys and 
boys and girls, she got a better offer. One of her friends wanted to go out with her instead. And she's gonna go out with them. Like, oh my own no! <laughs> Boys and girls, isn't that shocking? Isn't you, you? You would think, you would think that Kate would do something better than that. I mean, you'd think she'd know not to do something like that, wouldn't you? I mean, and now you really get to know what Kate's really like, don't you, boys and girls? Hmm. Hmm. Be insight into Kate, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, before I get strangled, Kate didn't let me down. That was only a wee pretend thing. Just to let you know something, though. Because we do get let down, boys and girls. People do let us down. I've talked about this before. I think I've said it to you before. People do let you down. And uh, you'll let other people down. And I looked up on the videos that I did in the past to see if I'd said it. And I couldn't find one where I have said it. I'm sure I have said it before. But in case I haven't, boys and girls, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Listen up. God will never let you down. He will never let you down. Bible says God will never leave you or forsake you, and that means let you down. God will never let you down. Kate will let me down. I will let Kate down. People are going to let you down. Your friends will let you down. You'll let your friends down. It happens all the time. Sometimes it happens by accident. Sometimes we just make wrong choices. But one thing is for sure, boys and girls, and that's all I want to say, God will never let you down. Never, never, never. In fact, God forsook his own son on the cross so that we could be saved. Isn't that amazing, boys and girls? It blows my mind. So I want you to remember that, boys and girls. This Easter, when you think of the story of Easter and you think of Jesus dying and then rising again, that was all for you and for me, for anyone who believes in Jesus. All for us. Because Jesus died in our place. And God has promised that he'll never let us down. He never did let us down because he sent Jesus to fix the mistakes in the world due to sin. And that, boys and girls, is phenomenal. So, have a great Easter break. No school, no homeschool. Isn't that brilliant? Woo. Teachers, you have a good break too. You deserve it. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. We are on our last section of our journey to the cross and today, Palm Sunday, we are on the cross. We have journeyed with Jesus to the cross. Today we stand with his friends and family from a distance and we watch. We watch as his hands and feet are pierced. We watch as the soldiers divide his garments among themselves. We watch as people shake their heads at him. We watch as people stare and gloat at him. We watch as they shout, he trusts in God, let God deliver him. We watch as Jesus takes on the horror of the crucifixion and the terror of facing not only God's wrath, but being forsaken by his own father. And we watch as it is finished. Jesus hanging there in agony on the cross, forsaken by his father. And that's one thing at least you hope will be the case, isn't it? 
No matter what happens in your life, you hope that your dad has your back. No matter how bad things get, your dad isn't going to leave you or abandon you. Your dad isn't going to forsake you. Your dad is always going to be there for you. That's what you hope anyway. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. But for Jesus, did his father have his back? Not this time. Today, we watch as Jesus is forsaken by his own father. But we watch in amazement as to why he does it. The father forsaking his own son means that he will never forsake us. The father turned his face away from Jesus so that he could look on us. If you remember, we looked at that a few weeks ago. But all of those things that we're watching today, the garments divided, the shaking heads, the staring and gloating, the hands and the feet being pierced. Why have you forsaken me? All of these are pointing us somewhere. And we need to go there to make sense of what we're watching today as we watch Jesus on the cross. Let me explain. I watched a film the other day about a man who was on death row for a crime he didn't commit. It was based on a true story, but I won't tell you the name of the film as I'm about to spoil it for you. After trying to fight his case, with the slight hope of redemption, just days before he was due to get his lethal injection, the innocent man shuffles to the room where his execution will take place. Chains around his ankles. He is strapped to a gurney and asked if he has any last words to say. And in those last words, he says this. I am an innocent man, convicted of an unspeakably heinous crime, which I did not commit. For 12 years, I have been wrongfully persecuted, despite me maintaining my innocence. And he goes on to say a few more things. He made his last words count. His last words were important. They were critical to him proclaiming his innocence. For those people who know that they're seconds from death, their last words are important. They use those last words to say something important or critical because it will be the last thing that people will ever hear. Think about that. Really think about that. When someone's about to die, more often than not, their words are critical. Tell Kate, I love her. There's a million pounds in my... So with that in mind, what are Jesus' last words? What critical thing was he trying to tell us when he cried out these words on the cross. Verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then John 19, verse 30, it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, these are Jesus' last words. These are critical, important words. We've kind of touched on the first about Jesus being forsaken, but what is he trying to say? What is he trying to tell us with these last words? These aren't just random phrases. Jesus is pointing us somewhere. And because you can barely breathe on the cross, it's not like Jesus can give some final monologue before he dies. He can barely get the words out. So as Jesus is about to die and face the ultimate torment, what is he trying to tell us with his last words? Because people's last words are critical. They are important. They tell us something important. What's Jesus trying to tell us? Well, like something out of the Indiana Jones films, where the body is pointing to a major clue, this is exactly what Jesus is doing on the cross. His first words as he's hanging there are, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And his last words are, it is finished. Which just so happens to be the first verse and the last verse of Psalm 22. Jesus is pointing us to Psalm 22. He is hyperlinking us to Psalm 22. It seems that Matthew has figured this out too by detailing these very things in the account of Jesus' death. Matthew is also hyperlinking us to Psalm 22. Everything in this scene is screaming at us, go and check out Psalm 22. Look at the similarities on the screen. We have 
the wagging of the heads. We have, he trusts in God, let him deliver him. We have the dividing of the garments. We have, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have the hands and the feet being pierced. People are staring and gloating at Jesus. It's one of those events that should have all of those gathered around getting their phones out and Googling those verses to see where they're from. However, since Psalm 22 is quite long, we're not going to go through it in much detail. But as an overview, here's what's happening from the psalm. First of all, the premise to the psalm is that David is in pain. He feels abandoned by everyone. He feels that there's no way out. Here are some verses that show that. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display and people stare and gloat over me. Now these are the words of David here in the psalm. So David is in anguish here. He feels that there is no way out. He feels that God has abandoned him. And so all this makes him cry out in verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish? Anyone ever feel like that? Like God has abandoned you? Like everyone and everything is against you? David is feeling abandoned by God. He feels that people are right to get him, mocking him for his faith. He is despised and rejected. Verse 6, nobody is near to help him. Verse 11, pretty much how Jesus was feeling on that cross. Probably why Jesus cried out in the same way. But Jesus' cry was a way of him telling us to go and check out this psalm. And here's one of the reasons why. Because in the latter half of this psalm, there's hope. Because halfway through the psalm, things take a turn for the better. At verse 22, things turn around. When there was doom and gloom, no way out for David, it turns out that God hasn't forsaken him, as David says in verse 1. No, God has heard him and he has saved him. And so the whole psalm changes from darkness to light. I will praise you, David says. All who fear the Lord praise him, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. David has realized that his cries have been heard. He realizes that God has not hidden his face from him, but has heard his cry for help. He has not been abandoned. He has not been forsaken. He may have thought that at the start of the psalm, But it turns out, no, he hasn't because God will never forsake us. You see, that's what Jesus was pointing us to. That while it looked like Jesus was being abandoned, forsaken, despised, rejected, and he was, but while all hope looked gone, Jesus was telling his friends and family members and everyone watching, I am forsaken, so you don't have to be. I am your hope. God has heard your cry for salvation and he sent me to save you. Go check out this psalm and see the hope that is there at the end. When all hope is gone, I am your hope. That's what Jesus is saying on the cross. So praise God. All you who fear God, praise him because he has not hidden his face from our cries. He sent a saviour. And because of this, verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Just like Paul says in Philippians 2, therefore God exalted him, that is Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Future generations will be told of the Lord. Verse 30, word of this will go on for years and years. This isn't some fad movement that's going to fade out. This story will be told year after year to generation after generation that God hears our cries and he answers them. He listens to us. He cares for us. 
He has done the only thing he could do to save us. He sent his one and only son. And he chose to forsake him in order that he could save us. So like David said, praise him, rejoice, revere him, kneel before him and worship because it is finished. Jesus accomplished what he set out to do. As Psalm 22 says, he has done it. It is done, complete, finished. Jesus doesn't have to die again. No more sacrifices, no more slaving after a law that can never be met. God hadn't forsaken David like he thought in verse 1. And he hasn't forsaken you or me. He's promised that he won't. Instead, he forsook his own son. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He forsook his own son so that he could save us. He forsook his own son so that we would not be forsaken. So take courage. God will never forsake you. He'll never let you down. You may have played the scenario out. If a house is burning, what three objects do you save? Now you can only choose three. Which ones do you save? Well, God could only choose one. Save his own son or save us. Logic and human reasoning would think that God would choose to save his own son rather than the people who are actively against him. But no. Romans 5 verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God chose to save us while we were still sinners, while we were against him, while he couldn't even look on us. He chose to save us and let his own son die in our place. Jesus was hanging there in pain and anguish, having become sin for us. And the father couldn't look at him all that so that he could look at you. All so that he could show you his love. All so that we would fall on our knees and worship. So God didn't forsake you. He has never forsaken you. And he never will forsake you. So when you feel like the dogs are surrounding you, like the world is against you, when you feel like God himself has abandoned you, forsaken you, turned his back on you, remember this and remember it good. God will never abandon you. He forsook his own son so that he doesn't have to forsake you. That's how much he cares about you. Jesus, in his dying words, was pointing us to this psalm because it's a psalm of hope. Hope that God does hear our cries and he does answer. But also hope because Jesus went through all this stuff that David mentioned in the psalm. The wagging heads, the chance of he trusts in God, let him deliver him. His bones being undisplayed, people gloating after him, the pierced hands and feet, the dividing of clothes, being forsaken by God. Jesus went through what David went through. I think every one of us wonders where God is at times. Especially in times of personal hardship and heartache. When the phone call comes in from the doctor and it isn't good news. Whether finances, illness death of a loved one, whatever it is, sometimes we wonder where God is and we feel abandoned by God, like God has let us down. We feel that God has turned his back on us, forsaken us. We feel the pain of life all the time. There's sickness and death, there's loss, there's bereavement, there's disability, there's marriage breakups, abuse, and it's all around us. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're immune from it. David was king of Israel. He felt it too. Jesus is king of kings. He felt it too. Now I'm not here to give you an answer to the problem of suffering. But I also don't want to diminish the fact that we do suffer. David, like us, suffered. You and I suffer physically and emotionally and spiritually. But here's what we can hold on to. Jesus Christ suffers along with us. Jesus suffered the most unfair, painful, excruciating death. A death that he didn't need to suffer. Jesus bore the wrath of the Father on the cross. His own Father couldn't look on him. He was separated from God. So if anyone knows suffering, it is Jesus. David felt pain and anguish and cried out to God. Jesus felt pain and anguish and cried out to God. 
So it's okay. When we feel pain and anguish, when life is getting too much for you, it's okay to cry out to God too. But cry out in faith that he hears our cries and he loves us. That is critical. What happened in our scene today shows us that God cares. Cares more than we could ever imagine. So take courage, my friends, because we do have hope. Hope in Jesus Christ who bore our sin and suffering on himself. And like he said, it is finished. There's nothing more to do. There's nothing more for us to do except rest and trust in what Christ has done for us. And it was all for us. And it was all because God did and does hear our cries. And he answered them in a way that is better than any other way. But it cost him his own son. But if you ever feel abandoned by God, let down, forsaken, that God's turned his back on you. Read this passage and read Psalm 22. And see Jesus hanging there, forsaken by his own father. And remember that he was forsaken so that we don't have to be. Because God will never forsake you. Let's pray. Father, it is humbling when we read this passage and we see Jesus being forsaken by you. All so that you don't have to forsake us. The promise that you have in your word that you will never leave us or forsake us rings true because you had to forsake someone because of our sin and you forsake your own son. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for the freedom that we have. Thank you that we have escaped your abandonment. We've escaped separation from you because Jesus faced it for us. So Father, as we trust in Jesus, may we remember that you'll never, ever, ever forsake or leave or abandon those who trust in you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the punishment that Jesus put on himself because of us. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Don't forget to tune in on Friday for the Good Friday message.